The uh, desktop, that'll make it a lot easier for us here today. <laughs> for those of you who've been here in the past, maybe have seen Pete talk. Evil Pete has done a project that's kind of notorious, mapping the exchanges with his war dialer in the Bay Area. And now that the world is going wireless, he's kind of expanded that idea a bit, and that's part of today's talk. So, no further ado, Pete Shipley. Okay, tech on this is actually pretty simple, but everybody wants to hear about it, so here I am. Uh, just a quick note, on the uh, right-hand side, we've got a little application called NetStumbler, which we'll talk about later. You can see there's some humorous people out here with uh, fun APs. And um, pretty much NetStumbler will be available. I think it's, you know, it should, well, it's still in beta, but uh, when it comes to drive around, this is currently the, the program until we finish writing some Unix code that actually works directly with the uh, cards. So um, people asked what it's called. Uh, somebody coined war driving. Um, I like calling it land jacking. Somebody else is calling it uh, you know, WAN lacking. <laughs> so generally what the project is, um, basically to, to basically where, rise your awareness of this stuff. Um, people set up networks. They don't know what they're doing. I don't know how many people remember when the web first got like, noticed by the public, and all of a sudden, every company wanted to put up a website, and every company got hacked into because they had no fucking idea what they were doing. And it's same thing. You know, same thing happens over and over again. People people discovered FreeBSD and Linux. Oh, I can have a home computer. Next thing you know, everybody's home machine is being hacked. Yes. Well, same thing happened in wireless. Purpose of the project is basically raise your awareness of secure ramifications. We've all dealt with managers. Managers are stupid people. Sorry if you're a manager, but most managers are stupid. And uh, one thing about security is security is economics. Don't tell me that security is not this. Though. Security boils down to economics. Co you know, software is made secure when it is something that has to do with money. If they're going to save money by not making it secure, they'll do it. So most, of, most security managers will basically decide, well, why should we care about wireless security when it's obviously not a problem? Or maybe there's a security problem here, but not our problem. So uh, network, network security wireless lands. Uh, why is it so popular? Well, we have half the con wired up, and it didn't cost us much. And like, I don't know if you've been to previous cons, you know, that this networking cable is just impossible to use. Secondly, uh, we get, companies can hold on. They can basically deploy things. Large buildings can set things up. If you ever work at a company that expands like crazy, it takes, what, the local phone company six months to set up your T1? Or it takes a six-pack of beer in an evening to set up a wireless link. So. The results are very similar to web race I pointed out. Um, I, I personally feel that wireless networking has brought security back 10 years. This is fun for some of us and uh, makes others rich, but... In the long run, it's going to cost a lot of people a lot of money. Now, just to cut off on the questions, people ask, how do I do this? It's really not that hard. It's really trivial. You just say, you know, loosen cards have a nice little feature where you set your SID to any, and it will associate with the nearest AP. Simple. I, simply, I mean, this is really low-tech stuff. I wrote a simple script in Perl that resets my card, pulls the card, records your SID, pulls my GPS, gets to my longitude latitude, plops it in a file. Real simple. And then it was just a matter of post-processing, spit it out in the maps. Uh, somebody else, someone saw what I had done, liked it, and was a bit of a Windows progress. I mean, he actually wrote this, which is actually a little bit better. But literally, you drive around, you see stuff like, you know, literally, uh, maybe there's a lot of networks here because we're at DEF CON, but you, you stand on like Fremont and Market Street in San Francisco, and literally the screen will be full of open access points for large corporations and banks. Oh, so basically what I use, this is the hardware I use. If anyone wants the actual wiring, it's really trivial. The script's available free, www.org slash WI. You download, you know, download, what? www.org slash WI. And all the, way, all the scripts are there. There's even a, there's even a statistical program for, for looking up the stuff. Yeah. Now, detection methods. It's actually really easy. Uh, the first time was a quick hack. I basically, like I said, just took the Lucid card, used its ability to detect things. Older 802.11 cards don't do this. Some vendors don't do this. If you have a Lucid card that doesn't work, backflash it to uh, the firmware release back in November or January. Lucid kind of removed some of these features from the latest revisions because people were doing this stuff. 
Um, it's good. Just set your SID to any. If you're under FreeBSD, set your SID to a null string, and your card becomes a little slut. It'll just hook up to any AP in the area and just, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the script I run just resets polls, as I said, uh, detects. Uh, if you think about it, right road is really inefficient, but there's so much out there, it works really well. I've, I mean, literally, I could drive at about 80 miles an hour down the freeway and lock onto people's access points and home access points. No problem. Uh, I had, when I first version of the program, I actually had a bell that rang every time I found an AP. I took that out of the code real fast. <laughs> <laughs> you drive, you come, you drive along with something, there's bing, 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 your friend's like, is something wrong? Your car okay? Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah, doors open, yeah. Keys ignition. <laughs> um, like I said, the data's log pro pro process. People who are writing code like this, I encourage you to. Um, I actually am working on some stuff, which I'll talk about later. Oh, wake this guy up. Um, this stuff is pretty good because it actually keeps a log. Uh, one nice thing of this is actually outputs say, the file in the same format as my script, so it can do post-processing. See, as you drive down a road or street, you get points along the street of different, wave, basically different signal strengths. Well, if you quantize your location into a grid and then do averaging, I could actually find which building your AP is. So if you drive up 1st Street and drive up 2nd Avenue, you can calculate where it is. Or if you're driving around a business park and you just circle the complex, I could tell you what building and sometimes even like what area of the building the whole thing's connected to. Snip it. What's that? Snip on. Yeah, well, officially, I only look at IP headers. I will not look at anybody's personal data. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> now, long distance. Uh, Matt, who's out here somewhere. Um, Matt, yeah, who's out here somewhere. We and him uh, got together one day and decided to go up to the Berkeley Hills. And um, actually, you beat this record, did you recently? The distance record. You beat the, you beat our first distance record, didn't you? Yeah, you got you got a 20 mile link. Um, the fun part about this is I'll show you a picture of it later. A nice 24 dB antenna got up on the hills, pointed it to the far, literally at the horizon in San Francisco, and I got into an office AP. Now there are APs out there with big antennas and amplifiers, but the one I actually was able to bump into was this corporation with an AP sitting on somebody's desk. Yeah. I did this over 13 miles away. So the managers out here, which I'd love to pick on, who think, well, it's not a problem. We have a security team. We'll spot any of these long-haired hackers in a car sitting in our parking lot. <laughs> Sorry. OK, simple geometry here. You're, you're on the ground at sea level. The horizon's three miles away. We were up on a hill in Berkeley. Our horizon's 35 miles. They were 13. So theoretically, I was hacking them from over the horizon. Go ahead, keep looking in your parking lots for me. Yeah. I'm the car, I'm the black car doing 80 miles an hour by. I mean, it's. Oh, yeah. uh, so, the, the important part about this is we were able to locate the APs. I knew where they were because Wyatt, my friend, had driven around the area. And like I said, we do the triangulations, we knew exactly what it was. We pointed the dish at San Francisco, marked down all the MAC addresses that we discovered, cross referenced in the database so I knew the remote location, typed into the GPS, over 13 miles, no problem. And he did some similar things uh, another day, breaking 20. Uh, this is the view from uh, Matt and I had up in the hills. Uh, those of you familiar with Berkeley, that's uh, the Campanile. This is all Berkeley campus. That's Emeryville. You know, Emeryville is one big piece of landfill. Got the Bay Bridge and, of course, um, San Francisco. Uh, nice little view there, and this is really scary. Can you see the buildings in San Francisco? Well we, well, we could barely see them. We had access to every one of their lands. It was actually, well, we actually now have a, we were going to set it up to show you. We actually have a tripod mount for the whole dish. Really hot. Wyatt did a really good job on that. But um, with this, I was actually holding up the dish, pointing across it. And, you know, Matt's reading off the data. It's like literally just every, you know, every time the thing moved even half a degree, we got another land. Took a pigs in a barrel. That's myself holding up the dish. Uh, dishes are really cheap, only 80 bucks. Antenna systems, you can buy them as low as cheap, uh, 30, I believe. No. Well, not, not always. There's actually, the, there's, there's, now that the ISPs are going out of business, cheap hardware. <laughs> Go on. Here's Wyatt modeling the uh, Yagi system, which didn't work as well as planned. Uh, that's a 15 dB Yagi. 
Um, it's okay for direction finding, but not for uh, long distance snooping. So if you're going to do a long distance stuff, we need to really go with the, with the high dB dish. The 15 dB Aggie just doesn't cut it. Um, one little thing, always have your portable power supply. Radio Shack sells a nice little toy, gives you 7 amp hours or 12 volts. You know, enough to power your laptops for 3 or 4 hours. It just kicks ass. Now, the next thing we're doing. Um, the way people get asked, well, how do you secure things? Well, the way you secure things typically is to turn off beacons. Well, you want to use web. Or, you know, web's been cracked. But you want to use web because it stops a casual person like me from pulling over and checking my email. And that's going to stop 90 to 80, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the people trying to hack into your system. Uh, the only way to really secure a site these days is to basically set up a DMZ zone, only allow IPsec through. So have the router does a DMZ or the firewall do a DMZ, only allow IPsec connections with authentication. And that has to be your wireless network. Other than that, you're screwed. Unless you're willing to open up free networks. In fact, I'm going to drag Matt up here in a second so we can, uh, a little bit later, so we can talk about the idea of free networks. Yeah, and he's like, look at me. Yeah, right, Pete, thanks. Uh, oh yeah. But the next generation so we we're talking about is uh, the Prism. Well, there's various chips available. The Prism 2 chips are really fun. There are drivers for Aeronet. There are patches for FreeBSD. I'm talking to a friend and committing them to the tree right now. Hmm? Ah, Prism cards. Huh? Ah. Well, we'll get, we'll get to that in a second. But basically, with, with these cards, most hardware places don't let, you try, don't let you read the packets, especially the web packets. Turns out with the Prism cards, you can. You just suck the data up. You crack your web. But the way you secure your network is you turn off the beacons. All this software over here is doing is reporting all the AP beacons that it sees. You turn off your beacons, your automatic network configuration doesn't work. You have to know the net ID, you have to know the channel to get your network to work. But at least people don't drive by, stop in your parking lot, and pick up your beacons. Uh, it hasn't been held up in court yet, but there's an argument. If you're transmitting a beacon saying, hi, here's an access point, talk to me, and I receive it, am I, doing, am I illegal? Am I gray area? <laughs> Actually, it's debated. Receiving your IP packets is a different story, but actually just intercepting your beacons and logging it is still open. Yeah, it's telling the, yeah. So effectively, what we're doing next is actually uh, in about two or three months, I was actually hoping to do it by DEF CON, but a friend gave me tickets to London and I got really drunk, so I didn't write the code. So, but effectively, uh, we're putting out some code. It's going to basically do all the Prism. There's always some Prism dump stuff out. So in fact, do a search for Prism dump. Runs on Linux, does nice things. Uh, use some of that as a base. Do a nice little utility that works on the Unix. Does all the, does all the right things. But your network will not be able to hide. Okay. Now anybody can do this uh, with a with a web with a Lucent card. Uh, again, uh, we'll show next some more. Next. What the hell? Let's repeat. Oh yeah, this is a fun one. Now for those of you who didn't bother installing software, but just have the standard Lucent stuff installed, it takes. It's, you don't need special software. You don't need to run FreeBSD. Any Windows machine with Lucent card could work. Uh, set your SID to any. Go into your uh, client manager. Click on Advanced Site Monitor. And uh, this is a picture that I got from Matt. He was standing on uh, Fremont Market, which is one of the like, down, you know, center of business section, and uh, those amount of available networks. And I believe what Matt was telling me when he got uh, ran Etherpeak, I believe for the first time on that on that sidewalk, the Etherpeak crashed from all the packets. <laughs> That much data, and if, if you notice, these people have no idea what they're doing because um, everybody's set up on the same frequency. Mm. So basically, people are setting it up; they have no idea if there's somebody else next to them. None of them get decent bandwidth. But literally, the standard, you know, you know and you, this is already installed on your Windows machine. It'll tell you what networks are around. You just click on that and have fun. You don't need a GPS. You literally walk down the street. And by the way, the casinos have wireless lands. <laughs> Now, statistics. This is the fun part. This is why I'm doing this. I want, I'm doing some statistical generation of things. And I'm trying to find out you know, what is the problem, what else is going on in the world, and um, what's going on. Well, so far, I've spent um, well, many a day and afternoon. Usually, we get a friend who's good to talk to. We take turns driving. Um, I kind of as fond of my friend's outback because so much room in that thing, lots of power plugs. And you've got two sunroofs for extra antennas. So. <laughs> I uh, currently got about 1,500 APs located in the Bay Area. Uh, this is not enough for a good statistical, you know, those of you who stayed awake during statistics in school, this is not enough of a sample, but I'm working on it. But so far, it's the scary part, 
you know, over 85% don't use encryption. Those running web usually use a default key. Default keys are 10, 11, 12, 13, or 1111. Uh, Zam, if you run him around here, he has a nice little uh, file actually. He's built quite nice of uh, statistics of all the different APs, what the default SID is for that, different, for that type of card or AP, what the encryption type is. B, the, the data T Pete just talked about is archived on the Wisconsin 2600.org web server slash media horror slash NF0 slash wireless. Contains all sorts of things from Dane County and around Milwaukee, um, including a few hospitals who probably shouldn't have patients staying there anymore. Yeah. Didn't you mention you had a better network connections to the hospital than you do at home? <laughs> how many hops were they from, from above net? Like, how many hops were they from above net? A place that does medical imaging in Madison is like two hops from above net. They appear to have some s insane pipe to their office. They just do video creation. I'm sorry. There's a place in Madison we found. Um, I don't yeah. remember the URL. I want to yeah. say it was Illustrated Ideas or something like that. And they do some insane medical imaging, and they have insane pipe. And trace routing from their network, it was two or three hops from above net. From my laptop, I could hit things in six to seven milliseconds in a parking lot faster than I could from the, the DS3 at the university. So it was OK. I would not complain. Yeah, he's pretty much doing the same thing I'm doing, but in his area. One last thing. The, the file Pete talked about is called defaultsids.txt. And I've been keeping a versioning history of this. As I get an AP to play with, I just commit the data. Interesting things, authentication it uses, allowing how you manage it, all sorts of stupid details, default max, that kind of thing. And it's basically just kept in a file update every month or so as I learn new shit. So just give it a shot. It's in just media horror slash info slash wireless. Yeah, some cool. funny stuff in there. Like uh, until recently, anybody here have a home Linksys SAP? SAP? Yeah, have you upgraded your firmware yet? The home Linksys SAPs don't have a password. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's the mount for the antenna, which we probably forgot to bring. So uh, we we'll get back to statistics. Those basically, some people barely running web. Very few, most people use default keys. You run into a network running web. Try key one is 10, 11, 12. Key two is uh, 20, 21, 22. Trust me, it'll work a lot of the time. Don't bother trying to crack the web. You guess it most of the time. Uh, most of them are wide open. Uh, you won't believe how many BGP packets and RIP packets I see driving down the street. I mean, if you're basically if you're seeing BGP over that, that means you're that means you're next to one of the core routers, talking to another core router, and their AP is in a place where their pants are down. I mean, we all know about routing protocols. If I was to start transmitting a few routing updates to their network, they'll never fucking figure out what happened. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, you get you just forge an address and a routing update. It gets inputted. Might even propagate over the internet. <laughs> They'll never figure it out. <laughs> and don't even think that the AP is going to, you know, my, you know, eat my MAC address can tell anything. When I drive around, my MAC address is officially dead, 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 dead. It's kind of a running joke in the Bay Area Wireless Users Group because people report, yeah, we saw you drive by. You popped up on our list. <laughs> no, it's a running joke. Uh, statistics, here's the top 10 SIDs. I know they're all default. Uh, Waveland Network, Airwave, that's Cisco. By the way, when you see any of these, as a um, SID, that means they didn't bother changing it, which means they probably didn't change many other things like the password or the web key or any other default configurations. Uh, the Apple Airport with the hex afterwards, those are basically um, people with uh, Macintoshes with a card in it running in AP mode. Based on, SC, based on the SEDs and other things, that, uh, SEDs and basically not using weapon stuff, 60% of APs are running the default configuration. Uh, five years, right, this is, okay, this is what I've stumbled upon recently. I think it's really interesting. Uh, we all know about Dan Farmer's, you know, the internet has this pants down, you know, paper he put out. We showed that 60% of machines on the internet are, are vulnerable. Of those 60, 40% are just like outright wide open. Uh, it's a well-known paper, it's been published way too often. Uh, I did the war dialing thing, exact same statistics. 
So now I'm doing this other stuff, I find the exact same statistics, which means we're looking at a constant here. Go on. Um, results agree. 60% show signs of weakness. 33% have problems and holes. This shows we have a constant insecurity. In other words, companies say, oh, we get on the internet, we're going to be insecure. I show that's bullshit. I show there's more ways of breaking a computer suit dial-up than there is over the internet half the time. Well, so Dan Farmer has shown that most machines are wide open on the internet. I'm shown they're open on dial-up and wireless. I'm talking to some other people who are going to start taking better statistics and showing that they're wide open via physical audits. And if we could show a common of 60% is no longer the fact that the internet gives you security problems or dial-ups give you security problems. It's just 60% of companies are insecure. We know this, but they're not going to listen until we prove it. Uh, so far, wireless survey shows same numbers. As I said, it, it basically it infers a definitive constant. Those of you who are heavily into the security field, this is actually a really juicy thing because when you write, or you basically respond to RFPs and stuff like that, you can convince them to pay you lots of money because they have problems. Go on. Now, uh, here's some, I guess, I, you know, I guess eye candy for you guys. Uh, we generated some maps. These maps were a little bit skewed as we were working on it. That's uh, San Francisco. That was a that was a 25 minute drive. I was with a uh, actually I think that's the drive where me and Kevin Paulson basically uh, jumped in the car for about an hour, and just spun around and literally. 25 minute hour. Yeah. Well, well, we had we had about, spent about 25 minutes driving around. It was about an hour total on the road, but this data most of this data was collected within literally within half an hour. I mean, talk about you know come on, you know fish in a barrel here. It's really not funny. Uh, next. Here's another drive where we hit different areas. Uh, I get some really good ones in here. Um, I can't really see all the SIDs. But uh, literally, I was driving around London and got the exact same statistics, except for I had SIDs like Britney, you know, Britney Spears. But I don't understand that one. Here's yet another map of even more data. Um, yeah, uh, that's actually, we, some of these were there. Actually, a lot of these were actually transmitting from here but we have such a clean signal path, they're appearing here. This is a drive when uh, Wyatt and I drove around for, I guess, most of the afternoon, actually. But we, Wyatt and I concentrated on areas that I hadn't hit before, which were, I guess, upper middle class that didn't have too many wireless access, so we were driving through the parks and stuff. But we still got quite a few just by driving around. And one thing about driving around collecting these things, you'll find networks where you don't expect them. Uh, in, um, in this area, okay, you've got the hate right here is loaded. In fact, this does not do justice. This is the first script that does it. only puts the first 64 networks on the map. But it doesn't make a difference because they're all on top of each other anyway. The hate's really crowded. You walk down the hate, not actual hate, but page or call right on the side. It's like two or three networks per block. That's where all the little Gen Xers got their little apartments with their little goth girlfriends, and they all got wireless networks. <laughs> now... Yeah. Now... Around uh, here is what's called South of Market. That's where the old dot-com things were. You couldn't find a place for your front teeth. You, but now all of a sudden, all the dot-comers failed. But you still drive around that area. You'd think, is all the startup places are. Even when the startup places were there, there weren't that many wireless networks. It's kind of weird. Uh, Matt's is there, but he likes it there. Matt actually has an open AP for people to actually openly use stuff. But he'll talk about that later. Uh, so driving around here. Um, here's a cool little trip, I think. I think this is my, actually the first time I drove around. Uh, Silicon Valley. I might recognize some companies. I love Ed's tech office. Uh, I'm not sure if the, number, if the numbers showed up here or not. Uh, Dermsville, Nokia, Waveland. Uh, there's actually some, like, uh, some serious uh, funding, you know, some capital uh, venture companies I found. It's kind of scary. Mind you, these are mostly along the freeways. So the majority of these were just me just driving on the freeways at high speed. Yeah. Now, this opens up another big question. What's free? Um, Matt, myself, a lot of other people, Cliff, believe that we should make an effort to set up free open lands. But how do you tell what's free? Uh, what scenario I bring you? You're right. Okay. All we know is Starbucks is now offering a pay-per-use wireless access. Okay, you walk into Starbucks, you, you, know, you, start, you start, set your ID to any, you're in Starbucks, you're typing away, checking your email, you're paying way too much for access, but you're still there, you're doing this stuff. 
you walk up, you turn your back, maybe put yourself between the AP or something else, and the company across the street gets associated with your card. Now you're doing your, rep, you're doing your traffic through the corporation land across the street. What if they have a clue and figure out what you're doing? You get arrested. Do you try to break into the network? No. You walked up, you paid the typically kid behind the counter, you know, the bucks to use their wireless LAN, you're trying to be legit, but no, the other company transmitted beacon, there was a stronger signal, your card associated with it, and now you're using their LAN, you don't even know it, because they gave you a DHCP address, you clicked on your little Netscape icon, it popped open to Hotmail, and you're checking your mail. And you get arrested. Bit of a problem here, isn't it? And that's one of the things you have to deal with, and uh, that's actually still a lot to talk about. And let's see, credit due. Uh, Matt uh, helped me a lot in understanding some of the, te some of the technology and hardware here. Uh, Aaron Peterson wrote all the uh, scripting software, no relation to Matt. Uh, too bad Aaron can't make it out here this year. Uh, Cal, who's probably wandering around here somewhere drunk, uh, helped me a lot with, some of the, with Linux drivers and getting them stuff to even compile in there. You know, everybody knows how much I hate Linux, so uh, made him work on it for me. Uh, Wyatt uh, is an awesome guy. He turns large pieces of metal into small pieces of metal. Uh, we were going to set it up, but we got a little bit lazy. This is like a mounting bracket. A counterweight drops into this. We actually have that big parabolic dish set up on a tripod. whole thing weighs just a little over 10 pounds. You know, it's boom, boom, boom. You set up. You get hacked into somebody 15 miles away. Oh, yeah, and two things to point out. Check out Bay Area Wireless Users Group. It seems to be the center of a lot of wireless information. Uh, we're working on doing things. Matt will describe some of the features they're going to be coming up with. And, of course, um, at Disorg, at WI, I'm going to have various links, uh, eventually build up a better page of the information. But right now, I'm just putting my scripts up for free. I encourage people to go around, map out networks. If you actually do a decent job mapping out the network, you know, I would love to add it to my database so I have better statistics. I don't want to just like, oh yeah, in my town, I found one or two from walking around. No, I actually need a decent demographic analysis with the GPS locations. I'll feed into the data and we'll have much better statistics. So while uh, your internet wants to be free, Yes. Huh? Redmond? I don't know. Well, when, I, when I drive that direction again. What's that? Sure. Matt, do you want to talk about, Bay, about yeah. B-Wug? Or? Actually, you're talking about hinting the other things like Redmond and stuff like that. Uh, I'm, I'm a virus. I'm not actually just Pete's uh, space bar boy here. <laughs> um, after Pete started working on this, um, I had quite recently bought a 1974 VW bus, which is actually a, a perfect vehicle for doing things like this because it's got a lot of space. The windows are very easily to tent at, uh, you know, limousine black, and uh, there's a lot of room for a lot of people with laptops. It's also one of the few vehicles that's actually designed to hold another large battery. So we're installing a uh, deep cell marine battery in the back. Uh, we hooked up 110 uh, converters and then put in 110 plugs throughout the whole back seat and near the table and the front seat, plus 12 volt converters. Mounting directional... <laughs> <laughs> I think that's bad shot yeah, on the wireless vehicle. <laughs> the only real drawback here is this is ugly orange with a white top, but how inconspicuous is that? Yeah, I think that's bad. You should check out Wyatt's, Wyatt's Bronco tube. The only problem is he uh, basically titanic did it the last Burning Man, and he's still, thinking, still full of mud. Yeah. So it actually was like, half the car is actually half underground. <laughs> we uh, were also uh, installed, just installed a big huge table there that we can use as a workstation. Everything is all set there. We're installing antennas on the top, um, making a lot of them look like cell phone antennas and so forth. But basically, in a nutshell, I can have four people um, scanning and doing whatever they would want. Um, I'm assuming they're going to be playing Doom while I'm driving. That's just my guess. Um, but it's, it's designed, and I can cruise around. Now, if anyone's even familiar with a VW bus, they really don't go much faster than about 65 miles per hour with a good tailwind. So it's really a great vehicle for this, except for the uh, unleaded smell you get from the uh, engine in the back. Environmental terrorists. Uh, VWs, by the way, put up more pollution than almost every other car on the road. So I'm doing my part for the economy, yeah. you, know? <laughs> you know. So we started... Uh, designing this and putting it together. Um, and then what we're gonna do is set up with a laptop in the back, so no matter where I'm going, if I'm going to the grocery store, the moment I get in, it automatically boots up the laptop and starts to scan. You know, and uh, 
before Wednesday when I got laid off, I was actually doing a 150 mile commute all over the place, back and forth from home to work. So the, the idea here is, is as I'm going to work, as I'm cruising around, as I'm sitting there, uh, because of the battery I'm putting in there, the laptop can actually stay on while I'm at work, just kind of waiting for things to happen, and uh, off we go. And then I'm going to be turning that data over to Pete for the uh, analysis, uh, especially since I'm in the Sacramento area. So if you're in Sacramento and you have a wireless network, God bless you. So uh, before we move on a little bit, any questions, General? Or uh, No engine noise problems. We're talking mm -hmm. 2.4 gigahertz as opposed to a couple kilohertz. Oh, he was asking if there's any problem with engine noise? Yeah. Negative, no. And also, shielding is really easy to do with aluminum foil. Actually, it's anything you use is going to be shielded at that frequency. Strat? Uh, try WI or WL, what are those? WL. WW disorg slash WI or slash WL, It'll, it's in there. Yeah. We'll double check it in a second. Till. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, um, repeat the question. Uh, stealthy antenna, you mean like this? Oh yeah, this is uh, more than enough dB, no problem. Do you have a backpack? Okay, a trick, you don't want to, you really don't want, you really don't want high dB antenna because um, the way, okay, the way Matt's friend explained it to me, the best way to explain dB, if you don't know it, is a light bulb is one dB, you put a reflector underneath it, it's two dB, so the higher dB of your antenna means the less area it's sensitive to. So when you have a omnidirectional high dB antenna, it could only see for a small, view, for a small like plate-like view around it. So literally, as you walk by, uh, where he works at Critical Path. As you go, Critical Path is an AP available to the public. As you, dr as, you pro as I approach Critical Path, I get a good signal. As I get within a block or two, I, lo I lose most of the signal because they're above me, and my antenna doesn't have much vertical reception. So I really don't want. So for you driving around, you want your antenna to be five or eight dB. And by the way, this is a nice little uh, five dB antenna. Is that stealth enough? Yeah. That would be in your pocket right there. Yeah. Uh, sure. Can you speak up? We can't hear you. Oh, well, well, physical address filtering is worthless because I'm going to see your MAC address and I can just assume your MAC address. Any. Any sniffer program, TCP dump. What? <laughs> yeah, WI control dash in. Yeah, any, yeah, Windows will do it, literally. Uh, you know, MAC address based security is not. Yes, yeah, so under Windows or, or Unix, you literally just, in if config, you change your MAC address. Yes, really. When I war drive, my MAC address is dead, 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 dead. I mean, make it easy for people. No, MAC addresses are easily faked and modified. Test. So, yeah, even in uh, Windows, you can actually go in the control panel and uh, test that out. It's, it's pretty easy to do. Basically, anybody with any networking skills or knowledge actually knows that. I was being nice. Uh, okay, so what? Uh, okay, well, sure. All right, we already have it set up right here. Doing okay, everybody know what the control panel is under Windows? Wait, we're not up there. Right. Uh, newbie track is downstairs. We, got we have it. a special session tomorrow on changing your IP address with Windows GUIs. <laughs> okay, this is no, actually he's under uh, Unix right here, but yeah, we can show you how to do it under Windows too. But literally, you just type in the command, and you change it. They want to see the Windows control I'm panel. All right, they want to play with Windows. Okay. Uh, what are you doing running Windows and coming to this conference? Yeah. They're playing Doom. I run it for power. Hey, I run it for PowerPoint. 
Uh, I don't run Windows. These guys do. But uh, the, the idea, basically, you can go in the control panel. I'm working on it right now. But any operating system that supports the wireless cards, whether it's Linux, yeah. Windows, Macintosh, they all Actually, let yeah, you spoof down, the Mac address. The reason they let you do that is because if you set web keys and also on your access point as a security mechanism, your access point administrator can say, OK, I don't want to deal with web. So instead, I'm going to plus, you know, these three good guys for Windows. OK, so all the drivers have always let you change that for that reason. So it's nothing spoofed. There's no hacks. There's no diffs. You go into your control panel. We're doing it right now. For those who you know think it's <coughs> bullshit, <laughs> as we heard earlier. Who wrote that stuff? Um, I, I don't know his last name. Marius Milner. Yeah, he's in the Bay Area. He hasn't actually come to any meeting. He just emails me updates, and it's like, cool. Literally, you go in here, you click on this, you click on properties, you can change it. Go ahead and do it, do it for him. He can. Actually, he can do it with this card. I know. Do, uh, I don't have the Lucent drivers installed. Yeah, you, pop it, you pop it up. We need the Lucent drivers installed to actually do it. Rush out of your machine? Yeah. Hold on, he's going to put it on his machine. He's got the Lucent drivers installed. Well, I don't have a Lucent card installed. He doesn't have a Lucent card installed, so it's harder to do on this. Keep your shirt on. Keep your shirt on. I can't believe you guys don't believe you can't change addresses. Just... We just did five times. We, we just did it on the Unix system a couple of times here. You know, I, this is amusing. Darwinism. And Darwin. <laughs> I just didn't bother loading the drivers. Okay. Yeah, he didn't put the drivers on. Not on that system. Is that all right? All right. Watch. Hold on. Blue screen of death. I'll move to your talk in a second. You got to promise, though, once it's been done, you cannot speak for the rest of the conference, okay? <laughs> Booyah. Oh, no, hey, Mojo, did you bring baby's first ball gag? <laughs> if, if you bought an Apple on the iMac, you have worse problems than changing your Mac, you know, Mac address. Remember, friends don't let friends buy Mac. Unless they're airports, you know. Or you need a boat anchor. Okay, I've been talking about companies that have open access that don't realize they're doing it. There's a lot of people who have access that want to grant. I mean, at my house, there's an AP. I have the AP outside my firewall. I don't have web turned on, and I have a default SID. Why? Because I want my neighbors to have free internet access. No, that's nothing. I only put out a few milliwatts. Matt had actually gone forth. He actually on top of his house in, on top of his house in uh, Hayward, and in oh. S Sapporo, San Francisco. He has areas where he's literally covering huge areas. Uh, we have front of us, Cliff in. Um, it's your game. You tell him. Um, yeah. Uh, so obviously, I'm a wireless person, not a security person. I'm coming from a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, this isn't my day job, so I just try to have fun with this stuff. And essentially. Um, you can do a lot of fun things with it. You can uh, basically build these kind of public mans. I'm trying to get the presentation going up here, but I've got a very slow computer here. And this is not obviously Windows. <laughs> I'm not going to do the full presentation because uh, this is not a wireless specific event. This is obviously a security event, so it's not appropriate. But Essentially, we've got a presentation that talks about the basics of 802.11 and what our mission is. I know. I see. And I just want to show one slide here, if I can uh, find it. Uh, let me take a second here. This is our kind of uh, the typical presentation we do uh, for, for people that are like, well, what's wireless and what have we done and, and all that type of stuff. If anyone's been to Burning Man before, this is how I got kind of addicted to this stuff. So let's, let me sec here. What's uh, interesting to note is there's different wireless cards that have different firmware in it. And uh, what's nice about it is that one of the first cards that came out was the Bay card. I don't really know about this, but this is the Prism 1 chipset. So if you look at the drivers in FreeBSD at least, uh, you'll note that all the drivers deal with 802.11 in a raw mode. So this is a really nice device to do sniffing. Uh, there's a group in Berkeley that did a, uh, a web advisory. 
Um, this is the card that they used. This is a Bay Networks card. I think it's 60 bucks. It's some surplus places down in the valley. Uh, you can get them on eBay. Uh, what's nice is this has got the Prism 1 chipset. Then what happened is uh, the people at Intercell uh, got their asses slapped and they made Prism 2. And if you're looking at Prism 2, you've got a couple different designs. You've got a reference design, which is your D-Links and your Linksys and, and that sort of thing. These are very generic cards. What's nice about them is you can actually hack external connectors to them. Uh, some of them are 30 milliwatts, some are 50 milliwatts. These are really nice. They have a different firmware, which is a reference firmware. The Orinoco cards have their own firmware. They basically bought Prism 2, dealed with it, and did their own thing with it. Uh, what's nice about their cards is they've got this external connector. Um, yeah, hacking connectors is, is, everyone's got different ways of hacking connectors. Uh, but these cards are really cheap. They're like 80 bucks at Fry's now. So if you hey, break you it, no back. big deal. Yeah. If you're driving around, you need an external connector. And for GPS, the Mighty Mouse 2 GPS antenna, give you a link, even in tall cities. Now, even more exciting is Aeronet, uh, which Cisco bought out about a year ago. Aeronet was an Ohio-based company. Uh, this card is 100 milliwatts. And what's nice about it is they've taken the firmware to the next step. Their firmware is really cracked out, but it's really powerful in the sense that they can do bridging in repeater mode. And it's a really sweet card because the 100 milliwatt makes a difference. You saw the screen capture of the just, uh, I guess, the Orinoco control panel in uh, downtown San Francisco. With this card, I found about a dozen networks. Uh, with this card, I found about 40. Um, it does make a difference. And in the case of my house, I've got an omnidirectional antenna on the chimney. I'm obviously roaming around inside of the house. This makes a big improvement. I get the five bars instead of three. Not that I run windows. Uh, this is the, um, the Cisco uh, 350 PCM model. They have one that does not have a built-in antenna. It's the LCM model. And it's got MMCX connectors, so you can build your own access point or obviously the ultimate uh, war driving machine. Uh, it's really sweet because it is 100 milliwatt and you don't really need to buy an amp if you're you know, kind of poor and whatnot. Because amps are very expensive. Uh, they're about $400 to get a one watt amp. Um, People ask, why, why are we doing the Wi-Fi thing for free? And there's a lot of groups doing this. I started this after Burning Man, where I built a network out there for Art Project and just anyone else to use. It did not have external internet access. Uh, a gentleman by the name of John Gilmore, if you've ever heard of uh, Sun Microsystems or EFF, that sort of thing, he brings internet out there. He builds his network. We build our network. Ours is a little bit more reliable because um, we don't have to deal with all that internet foo. And the, the idea was basically, you know, people have got art projects, and there's a neat project called Spin. And essentially, Spin is an LED thing that's spinning around, and it's an optical illusion. And this guy made this big, fancy Visual Basic software where you can make your own animation, you can make stars, and you can make like a Pac-Man thing. And it was great and all, but no one downloaded the software and sent him animations. So when applying it this year at Burning Man, you'll be able to go to a kiosk booth on an X terminal and type in your message or make your animation, and it'll be sent out over Plyonet to this guy's art project. So that's really the goal of Plyonet. But we did that. I came back to the Bay Area, and Wired and all these companies were attacking me and saying, hey, we need an interview. What are you guys doing? And obviously, my inbox got really full of saying, well, did you guys do anything illegal? It's Burning Man. Everything out there is illegal. That sort of thing. Um, it, it w yeah, exactly. Uh, we did have one watt amps. I won't say what the gain of the antenna was. The uh, FCC speculates how much radiated energy. They don't specify how many watts your amplifier is or uh, how good things are. So basically, they care about how much radiated energy. So if you're at the full maximum wattage of your amplifier and a really, really good antenna, you're illegal. Exactly. Um, there's other groups doing this. Baywalk is very generic. We're, we're focused, obviously, primarily on A211B because it's, it's cheap. It's really fun to deploy. Uh, Bluetooth, we don't even talk about. It's dead. Uh, Home RF is, is, is coming down the pipe, but it probably will die, too. But this stuff is so cheap. In the next six months, it's going to be a whole other ball game. You're going to have uh, laptops that already have this built in. You've got uh, PDAs that have this already. Um, what's great about Baywug is since we're not saying that we're building a specific network, we attract a pretty diverse crowd. So we've got ham operators, we've got VCs, and we usually have about five or six stealth startups that are specific to 802.11b and A. And they talk to me. Um, and I don't sign NDAs. And what's nice about it is that they've got a lot of neat products coming out. So in the next six months, this is all going to be crap because there's going to be NetBSD-based solutions. There's going to be Linux solutions. APs are going to be a lot more cheaper. Um, it's just getting better and better and better. Um, and obviously, uh, war driving is pretty exciting in the sense that there's more and more networks are just being deployed everywhere. 
Yeah, after that first article about the war driving stuff, you don't believe how much email I got, how many people were responding to it. It's insane. And whose good idea was to leave the vodka up here? <laughs> There's uh, some interesting projects going on. This is an antenna hack where they've got a Prime Star dish and a tin can. Um, <laughs> this, however, is not the best hack I've seen. Um, the guys in Spassable, uh, O'Reilly, everyone's heard of those books. There's a project called nocat.net. That's N-O-C-A-T dot net, as in no cat five involved. They essentially have a Pringles can with an end connector, and that's ten dollars. So it's a lot cheaper than this. The connector is the most expensive part. Building, uh, building networks is pretty interesting, at, um, of how that works. And I'm going to try to bring up an image here that you can see. Um, here's the frequencies, obviously, uh, the, the ones that don't overlap. Um, here's, let's see if we can get this link here. This is um, going across the bay between uh, my house and, and Hayward there. So uh, San Jose is down at the bottom. You've got Oakland, San Francisco, and Millbrae. This is a 20-mile link. Uh, originally, we were using Intel uh, 2011 access points, which are really kind of sweet because they do something called WLAN mode. And they can be an access point and a LAN bridge at the same time. Uh, the problem is, is that they don't do this too well. If they lose their link, they just reboot in the cycle. Uh, so they're not very good for doing bridges long term. So now we're switching with WAP 11s, which are $200. And if you get firmware that got accidentally released, you can do bridging with them. Uh, so now you're looking at about $200 for the access point that you can do bridge mode on. You get your, uh, your pigtail, and you've got your antenna, and you've got a point-to-point -point link for less than $500. Um, this didn't exist a couple years ago. You had projects like SF LAN and the Presidio that was using your frequency hopping equipment and, and BreezeCom equipment and whatnot. This stuff has gotten so much cheaper, and the price is really dropping. And What's great about it is you don't need to particularly join, you know, Baywug or NoCat or NYC Wireless. Um, you can do it with yourself. You know, if you've got DSL and your friend down the street is outside of the DSL zone and you can see each other, set up a link. It's, it's quite simple to do and, and the price is uh, dropping on it. Um, one of the things that's uh, interesting is, is calculating, you know, is this, this link going to work? So there's some commercial software which is pretty expensive to do uh, path analysis. Uh, obviously, it, it's not in the, um, uh, I can't afford that, that's for sure. Um, you can do kind of, a, this is the access point at uh, First and Folsom in San Francisco. I didn't take that picture. Um, this <laughs> is kind of the ghetto way of doing how, where does it cover? So we're just walking around, click and scan, and then we took the, a map and, and draw it out. Uh, this is the coverage uh, with a 15 dBi Omni uh, with an AeroNet access point of 100 milliwatts. And there's a bunch of tall buildings around here. Um, I wanted to show the picture. I guess we don't have the picture of a uh, terrain navigator. Um, that's, that's really, just real quickly, some of the stuff that we're working on. Um, Tim Pozar is another guy involved with, uh, with the Baywog. Um, there's a lot of other groups in different areas throughout the country. And on the West Coast, you're looking at BC Wireless up at the top, uh, Seattle Wireless. Personal Telco is uh, personaltelco.net. They're in Portland. Uh, we've got nocat.net uh, and Spassable up at O'Reilly. Uh, Bay Area Wireless user group is throughout the Bay Area. I think there's a group in San Diego. Um, moving more towards uh, the East Coast, you've got NYC Wireless um, and many other projects popping up. And what's really happening is people are really excited about this technology and they're saying, well, how do I get rid of my DSL and join this big man and all that type of stuff. And in reality, this stuff wasn't designed to create a man. It wasn't designed to compete with Ricochet. It was designed to connect two buildings or to put an access point and roam around in your conference room. So we're really pushing the limits with this. And the access point vendors don't like us doing that. So we're going to the next step where we're buying cards, we're hacking antennas. And then we're looking at getting like old 46s, you know, Linux boxes, FreeBSD, whatever, and building our own routers and that sort of thing. And our mission probably within the next six months is really cookie cuttering this thing out in the sense that you'll be able to buy, you know, this motherboard that's stripped down. It's got its PCMCA slots and it's got its mini PCI and it's got its compact flash and its console. And you download this software. It's got the captive portal and it's good to go. And you get this card and here's how you hack it. And this guy in your area has an LMR 400 crimper. Boom, boom, boom. You're good to go. Um, that's really what we're moving to here. And a lot of people ask us, well, what's going to happen when we do this? And, and we don't really know. It's very organic. It's just like the internet. Um, different projects are doing different things. And I see wireless has got a couple access points uh, within New York. And basically, you can go to, uh, as I like to say, you can go to like a donut shop, and you can get your, your access for free. 
and you're welcome to use that network. And we're working it on different ways of, you know, okay, you can put the SSID as call it free network or whatever. And the, the reality is, is that people are going to pop onto your network. And to be secure, you can't just put a, you know, a simple firewall in between. So we're looking at doing like Snort and IDS and kind of reversing the firewall methodology. So it, it, it's, it's a big project to do this because n none of this stuff exists. The manufacturers are really confused r right now. You know, what do we do? We're selling these $200 Linksys for people to put at home. And now all these free wireless people are building networks. You know, what do we do? Uh, Cisco right now has a major problem because all these dot bombs are dying. All their switches and their routers you can buy at surplus auctions. And the only thing they're selling right now is Aeronet cards. And they're all back ordered. And they don't know why people are buying them so much. They don't know where this, this market share is going to. And I'm not bullshitting. Cisco people come to our meetings and like, what, whoa, what are you guys doing? Um, so it's, it's really interesting what they're looking at. They made a good, definitely good uh, acquisition of Aeronet from Ohio last year. That, that was a good plan. Um, this is just real quickly, that was my, my uh, kind of quick overview of the slideshow. Um, like I said, baywog.org, uh, NYC, wireless.net. Uh, you've got personal telco, nocat.net, Seattle Wireless, and the list goes on. Uh, probably around November, October, we're going to work on a wireless summit somewhere in the Bay Area where it will be kind of formed like this, like a workshop type environment. You know, how do you build that Pringles can antenna? You know, how do you do war dialing? Uh, how do you build antennas? Uh, you know, big you know, kind of omnidirectional antennas. Uh, what, what's the best access point to buy? Uh, so this is definitely a movement that, that people should be aware of. And I think that people are a little bit scared by the media of saying, oh, Peter's driving around and he's war dialing and that's all bad. Well, it's really useful for us to get the statistical information to see what's out there. Because then we can approach these companies and say, hey, by the way, you know, X microsystems, you know, you guys make those great computers there. Uh, your network's not very secure. Um, why don't you, you know, put this out in the DMZ okay. and we'll All the major you. firewall companies in the Bay Area have open WANs. <laughs> Actually, I don't want to, sorry to cut you off a little bit. We've got about five more minutes. So we might as well answer a few more questions. Right there. So the question is, how, how do we deploy a network in, in parts of San Francisco to cover all of San Francisco? Um, from an RF standpoint, and I'm not an RF person, I'm not a ham or anything, uh, it's really hard to do right now because if you go to certain places in downtown San Francisco, there's already 40 access points you can hear and the default configuration with the default channel. So, you know, half of them are using channel 1 or channel 11. Uh, it would take a lot of coordination to pull that off. The problem is, is this stuff is not really designed to do repeating and whatnot. You literally have to pull a T1 in to each location. So what we're suggesting is basically the bandwidth's already there at these companies. Let's give them a Linux box that's got you know, DMZ in a box and they can do it. Um, that's not our immediate goal right now. We're looking at more getting that software made, getting that box made, instead of covering the entire city. It would take a lot of work and effort. There are some stealth startups that are proposing that. Uh, but it's really hard because the only wireless companies right now, like Mobile Star, that's got the Starbucks thing, and Wayport, and, and those other ones, they're not making money. Uh, and we're not in it for the money, so we're not going anywhere. Here's a map of New York, by the way. Starbucks. Yeah. Uh, the, the blue dots are where we drove, the red dots are where we hit Starbucks network, and the green crosses are where the Starbucks actually are. Um, Obviously, we haven't covered everything in Manhattan, but we've hit 1,400 base stations already. All right, questions? Wait, a good trick when war driving? Take the bus. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's just efficient. Get back, get drunk. Yeah. All right, question. Yeah, mass transportation like barges is a lot of fun. What? 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 What's the percentage of the corporate networks we're hitting while war driving? Encrypted. 10 to 15 percent, maybe. That's it. And Terry in New York said it's, it's a lot more in New York. So we're looking, looking at 75 to 85 in the financial I don't know. Bechtel areas. in San Francisco is wide open. Questions? Oh, London is pretty fertile also. Got right there.
tons. Incredible amounts. I'm very sure there's a lot of people on a lot of other people's networks that don't know it. In addition, we have two APs on the same channel that are stomp all over each other and reduce your efficiency by in half at least. And this has been demonstrated by the network at this event. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when the network is first set up around here. Yeah. Maybe next year we'll come back and we'll set it up. But right. uh, it's really hard to set up a wireless network when you've got you know, kitties arf spooping all night. Question long. over here. Uh, oh, this is the best place for access. Over wireless. The tent. <laughs> yeah, we got the height. Yeah. Also, the bar downstairs is pretty good. And it fits two purposes. Yeah. Yeah. The drink. All right, any more questions? All right, guy in the front. Oh, wait, after this, we'll probably walk down to the bar. So if you buy us a beer, we'll answer more questions. Wide open. Yeah. I really want to take my VW bus to Washington, D.C. Hey, you're already in this capital of uh, California, state capital. Yeah I'm, uh, yeah, I'm at the state capital of California right now, and that's going to be Entertainment Value 101. So, um, is that it for questions? Or? All right, all right, one more. Speak louder. Uh, no, at that frequency, I have no real. I haven't detected any Doppler programs. Um, I'm really effective around 40, 45 miles an hour. I've done efficient scans around 80 miles an hour. And it's not going to affect my bus at all. <laughs> so I think that's it for questions. Yeah, I think we run out of yeah. we run out of time. So thanks. Uh, I'd just like to make uh, one recommendation to uh, no one in specific, but a good book they should probably read is um, Networking for Dummies. Uh.